I would say the first speaker is Rachel Smith from Basfa University and Cardiff University. And the title of her paper is Emotions of Death, Grief and Anxiety in the Canning Family, in the Canning, sorry, Family Correspondence, 1760-1830. So um, the, floor is, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you so much for a lovely introduction. Um, thank you everyone for joining um, our panel this morning. A uh, nice early start for everybody on a Friday, so we really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about emotions of death uh, and arguing that we really need to think about anxiety as an emotional response um, to death and consider it alongside grief in uh, examinations of, of death, um, particularly focusing on uh, condolence letters and correspondence. Um, my research looks at the Canning family, so I'll be using them um, and a couple of other examples in this paper uh, to illustrate some of my arguments. So expressions of grief itself is not often a significant part of death studies. Scholars tend to choose to focus mostly on mourning processes, uh, funeral processes and rituals and beliefs about death and also sometimes about the afterlife as well. Indeed, Zara Newbury and Ruth Tolston acknowledge that there's been a significant academic interest in death studies. Uh, quote, such scholarship is frequently marked by neglect of grief. Correspondence is also um, used intermittently in these sorts of studies, despite work such as Kate Retford's study on posthumous portraiture, asserting that shared grief within familial epistolary networks was common upon the death of a relation or family friend. There are notable exceptions. Study, studies such as Lucia McMannon and Joanne Bailey's do examine parental grief through letters, and Thomas M. Carr's exploration of Voltaire's condolence letters also uses uh, the epistolary form to examine ideas of grief and condolence. Yet historians should be cautious in interpreting condolence letters as a reflection of grief without first considering what this emotion actually is. Um, according to uh, the OED, it's an emotional state described as, quote, hardship, suffering, and, quote, mental pain, distress, or sorrow, unquote. But grief itself is actually quite complex and few consider the multiple other emotions that are felt alongside grief or as part of grief. Whilst grief is the overwhelming emotion that's connected to death, anxiety and particularly expressions of anxiety are an undercurrent of correspondence at these points of death, most prominently featured before and immediately after the death occurs. It also features in correspondence um, maybe a few weeks, a few months after the death, uh, talking about anxieties that are direct consequences. So this paper considers expressions of anxiety to argue for the consideration of anxiety as both an emotional response and an emotional expression at times of death. Uh, Thomas M. Carr Jr. refers to an epistolary pact of three steps. This was, quote, an initial letter coming from someone near the deceased announcing the death the expectation that a letter would follow, from which a letter of acknowledgement must be sent." Unquote. Thus grief was ritualized through letters and, as Nicole Eustace also argues, displayed a, quote, complex set of constraints and conventions, unquote, which contained, quote, critical social commentary, unquote, of feelings of grief. What is less acknowledged is how the language and expression of anxiety specifically interplays with these expressions of grief as part of these epistolary conventions. So this particular uh, paper here um, is going to consider how the letters use the language of anxiety through this epistolary pact to renegotiate status and relationships. While this research, as I say, focuses specifically on the cannings, I have included a few other examples. And I would just like to make a caveat at this point that this paper is about 2000 words based on a 10,000 word PhD chapter. So feedback and further questions and further discussion is particularly welcomed. So some use condolence letters to secure their place within the family. Frances Braun wrote to her deceased fiance sister upon John Keats death in 1821. Her letter begins with condolences over their shared bereavement of Keats, but then quickly addresses Frances' main concern, her relationship posthumously with Keats' family. She asks Miss Keats to stay with her, quote, if it be not disagreeable to Mr. Abbey, unquote, who was her guardian at the time, for, quote, I must hope you will favour me with your company, unquote. She stresses that she, quote, felt so happy, unquote, 
when Keats desired me to write to you and her letter suggested that she is anxious for this relationship to continue beyond his death. As his fiance, Miss Braun would have not had a formal place with Keats's family and the letter tells of her anxiousness to renegotiate her position and stay familiar with his family after his passing. Miss Braun goes to such length to suggest all sorts of solutions to potential issues with her plan, suggesting its importance to her that it goes ahead. Still remaining sympathetic to Keats, Miss Keats's likelihood that she can't actually visit so soon after her brother's death, but talks about how her mother will welcome her with open arms and actually will help to rearrange the transport. The letter shows how those have undefined or established roles within a family can find themselves uncertain of their position and identity within the family at times of death. Francis's letter reveals the difficulties felt in losing one's potential familial place and the anxiety of renegotiating your position. It also shows how ties can be severed upon death and the anxiety of losing connections and intimacies that were enjoyed before the death occurred. Unlike Frances Braun, Hitty Canning's correspondence with her daughter shows how condolence letters shaped and strengthened existing relationships and deepened emotional intimacies. The letter opens with Hitty's usual subscription, My Dear Bess, but then goes straight into a lengthy and what we might identify as an emotional passage. Your beloved godmother is no more. She expired this morning about five o'clock in the midst of her family, of whom she took a most affectionate leave. She departed like an angel, and I trust is now a blessed spirit in the presence of our God. What I have gone through during these last 24 hours exudes all description. I never sustained such acute sufferings, but now, thank God, all is peace and silence. But never, never shall I forget what I have seen and felt. My only consolation is that I am comfort to the poor sufferers around me and that I soothed her passage from life to eternity. I have seen her, my dear Bess, and kissed her cold, pale cheek, beautiful even in death. Excuse me, my dear child, my sorrow is very great, but I will endeavour to compose myself, and you may be sure I will take care not to injure myself. In releasing these feelings, Hitty acknowledges that her writing style could cause Bess some discomfort and worry, for she adds that line at the end, excuse me, my dear child. Hitty's usual epistolary conventions then resume after this almost stream of consciousness style passage. She ends up using more full stops. She uses less run on sentences and less exclam exclamation marks, all tools she's adopted here. Despite Hitty's acknowledgement, her 16 year old daughter Bess, who was unlikely to have sent condolences before or even received news of a close death before, um, this passage has appeared to have caused discomfort and uneasiness. By refusing to define her motions within linguistic parameters, Hitty leaves Bess to imagine endless scenarios. Hitty's emotionally raw outbursts through those use of the terms, what I have gone through in the last 24 hours exceeds all description, and never, never shall I forget what I have seen and felt, appears to have caused unintentional anxiety displayed in Bess's letter from June 28, 1792, to the one following this, where Bess evokes that, quote, I'm afraid I shall find you badly unhinged, unquote, and that, quote, I entreat of you to take care of yourself for our sake, unquote. Indeed, after the opening passage, her letter becomes less about Eliza's death and more about Bess communicating her worry of Hitty's reaction to it. It can be determined then that Hitty's letter emotionally communicated to Bess her strong grief and emo emotional turmoil, as this is what Bess's response has suggested she has interpreted this as. Bess herself um, uses the condolence letter as a space to perform her own emotions, not necessarily just those of grief and condolence. She writes that, um, this moment I have received my dearest mother's sad letter, the one I got yesterday partly prepared us for it, but I cannot tell you what I feel and how much I lament the dear creature that is gone. I did not know her as you did, but what I did know, I could not love and admire, but love and admire. I shall never forget her kindness to me and shall always remember her with affection and think of her as one too good and too charming for this world. Yet in consoling her mother's grief, Bess had ulterior motives. Her letter continues in sympathy, but takes on a decidedly anxious tone in order to convey her love and affection for her mother, but also to impress how much she wanted her back. After consoling her mother's grief in this initial passage, Bess shifts to remind Hitty of her duty to her family. I entreat of you to take care of yourself for our sake. 
This reminder of Hitty's maternal duty reflects social conventions of avoiding excessive grief and neglecting your societal duty and the use of condolence letters in actually helping bring the grieved back into their societal roles. It also reveals that Bess is worried about her mother and how she will resume their relationship upon her return. How has their relationship changed and will be redefined by this death? However, as Nicole Houston states, quote, far from being simple and straightforward expressions of personal sadness, statements of grief conveyed critical social commentary in the 18th century, unquote. And this appears to be what's happening in Bess's letter here. It it's used to convey other thoughts and feelings. Condola's letters were therefore used for their author's purposes, trying to confront or relieve anxieties, but also as a tool for shaping these relationships post-death. This idea of hiding or tempering emotion was often employed in letters, particularly those sent to those at a further distance in order to avoid what Gary Schneider terms, quote, epistolary anxieties, unquote. These are anxieties that are caused through the writing, sending and receiving of letters and were particularly caused by the infrequency of the postal system. Thus, the way that grief and condolence was communicated in letters to loved ones effect, was affected by the distance, particularly those that were sent abroad. In 1815, uh, Stratford Hitty's son was posted at Zurich on a diplomatic mission through the Foreign Office. His posting meant that the communication would take about a month or two to reach the recipients. Hitty wrote to him there upon the death of his brother Charles at the Battle of Waterloo in June 1815. You can see the memorial plaque here. Her letter acknowledges that her condolences are overdue. You will naturally expect to hear from your poor mother in this hour of sorrow and perhaps think that she has delayed too long to impart her feelings to you on your common and heavy loss. She has been deeply afflicted, though possibly not so keenly as your dear self, who never knew grief before. I felt particularly for you, my dear Stratford, on this lamentable occasion, at a distance from your family, deprived of the sad consolation of mixing your tears with theirs, and of knowing many circumstances which, though mournful, give relief to the oppressed heart. Above all, for you having never seen your beloved brother since your first separation, which I have no doubt has greatly increased your sorrow and regret. While this could be read as guilt for her lack of letter, the passage infers her desire not to concern her son about her own health or indeed the family's health or well-being while still conveying her sorrow about Charles's passing. As Stratford would be unable to receive this letter for a few months, it is likely that a letter which expressed raw excessive grief like the one that Hitty sent to Bess the very next day could render him anxious for several months about his family until a letter could finally reach him to assure him of their well-being and how they were coping. Hitty's letter also contains an undercurrent of anxiety for Stratford's own well-being. She presumes Stratford's emotions when she states that Stratford's grief would be more deeply afflicted than herself because he, quote, had not known grief before. She shows further potential worries when she writes that his feelings will be increased because he hasn't seen his brother in years. So his grief is already potentially tempered with regret. She states her own experiences with death, outlining ways in which she coped and is currently coping with her own feelings, including religious belief of providence, that time makes things easier, and hearing kind words regarding her deceased son. By mentioning these own experiences, she outlines various ways that potentially Stratford himself could cope with his own uh, grief. She potentially, therefore, is likely trying to alleviate her own feelings of anxiety about Stratford's well-being when she could barely help him, um, him being in Constantinople and Zurich at this point. And she was trying to give him the tools to deal with his grief, as well as his worry, her worries about her ability to actually comfort him at a distance, particularly while she was dealing with these feelings herself. So this has just been a bit of a screen sort of snapshot into discussions of how anxiety actually features in uh, grief, uh, condolence letters and at times of death. Remote relationships were tempered with anxiety at such moments and where distance made comfort and alleviation more difficult. None was more difficult than the death of a loved one in general. From sharing anxieties about state of health to personal anxieties of self-identity, and how relationships would change, familial position and renegotiating relationships, anxiety in letters is an important emotion in understanding both the communication, but also the impact of death. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, very 
interesting paper. And um, let's continue with our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Gabriel Lawson from uh, Queen Mary University of London. And the title of his paper is Dream Analysis in the Stanag, the Paul W. Dream Diaries of Major Kenneth Hopkins. So, um, uh, thank you, Maria, thank for you the intro. Okay. And um, thank thanks to everyone for coming. I don't have a PowerPoint, I'm afraid. I'm just going to be um, reading off notes uh, okay. to stop my timer going. So, May. Major Kenneth Davies Hopkins was a school teacher and part-time Territorial Army officer from Birmingham who was captured outside Dunkirk in the spring of 1940 and held in Oflag 7C Laufen, an officer's prison camp in central Germany. While in captivity, Hopkins hatched upon the idea of collecting dreams from his fellow prisoners and analysing them, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Hopkins collected over 600 dreams from 89 contributors, which he then meticulously copied into a series of notebooks currently held by the Wellcome Library. Hopkins appears to have been planning to complete a doctoral thesis after the war, but he was unfortunately unable to finish it. He had previously undertaken a part-time MA in education at Birmingham Uni University between 1935 and 1938, supervised by the Professor of Educational Psychology, um, Charles Valentine, who will later kind of reoccur in this talk. Unfortunately, before his project could really be brought to completion, Hopkins died of emphysema uh, in September 1942 while still in captivity. At this point, I, say, I should say I'm indebted to the late David Stevens, who was archivist at the British Psychological Society, for establishing the kind of basic facts of Hopkins' biography and preserving the dream diaries. Um, so what are we as historians to make of this project and the voluminous dream diaries it produced? Peter Burke claimed in Annales in 1973 that dreams have a history and it should be possible to write a social history of dreams. Firstly, this is because dreams can provide the dominant images of an era. And secondly, this is because dreams can represent an indirect form of communication, which can supplement the kind of official documentation. Um, Kenneth Hopkins' attempts at dream analysis can actually go further than this in that he's got notes and bibliography which allows the reconstruction of his thoughts about the role of dreams in the camp and the wider kind of impact of imprisonment on the prisoner psyches. It's worth emphasizing that Hopkins had no medical training. He was not a lay psychoanalysis psycho diver. He was an interested amateur. He was a school teacher. He'd encountered psychological theory before the war um, during his MA course, and he sought to apply it to the experience of imprisonment. Uh, teachers in the interwar period were highly likely to encounter the work of Freud and other theorists in the curriculum, but the understanding was often rather thin and surveys found kind of little enthusiasm among teachers for this theory. However, Hopkins appears to have been really interested in psychological theory, in particular uh, Freudian theory. Um, and he kept up a correspondence with Professor Valentine at Birmingham University after he finished his course in 38. After he was captured in 1940, he uh, made contact with Valentine via letter and asked for his support in this project. Valentine replied saying it was an excellent idea and offering whatever help he could provide. Valentine personally felt that dreams had no deep significance. They were caused by kind of unknown physiological processes within the brain, but he happily supported Hopkins' attempt to glean meaning from the dreams. It's unclear why Hopkins chose to focus on dreams as his source material, although it's often been observed that captivity can produce a variety of strange and intense dreams. And Hopkins, with some experience of psychology, particularly Freudian psychology, perhaps sought to lean into this. It's Similarly unclear what his final motives really were, but his correspondence would appear to suggest that he was going to write a doctoral thesis or perhaps a series of articles after the war's conclusion. It's worth mentioning that he included his own dreams for analysis as part of this. He's dreamer number three within his kind of overall index, which I'll talk about later. Um, so he's basing a lot of this off um, Charles Valentine's works, in particular, The New Psychology of the Unconscious, which he had a copy of with him in the prison camp. Um, it's stated in this work that you, the application of psychoanalysis to cases of neurosis is just for medical professionals. Amateurs should stay absolutely clear. But at the same time, Valentine admits that he's taken part in analysing certain cases where an individual is in good health and they've got kind of minor symptoms, irrational anxieties, phobias, or kind of inappropriate emotions from inadequate causes. Hopkins appears to have seen this project not as treatment, but as... Um, a kind of 
a collective effort to understand and chart the mental changes that occur from captivity. Um, simultaneously to Hopkins recording and analyzing dreams within Laufen, uh, mass observation in Britain is also attempting to collect dreams on mass. Uh, the founders of MO, so Tom Harrison in particular, believed that dominant images could be kind of screened from these dreams. You can filter the noise and get really pinpoint images that uh, are reoccurring in people's um, minds. However, the project kind of falls apart because they have vast numbers of dreams that just don't feature the war at all. Um, the use of dream diaries by sociologists and kind of historians in retrospect is really difficult because dreams often possess a really private significance that is instantly lost. But Hopkins notes can help correct this slightly as he discusses the dreams with the dreamers and adds information that he thinks is pertinent. The process of creating the dream diaries should therefore be seen as a collaborative act between the recorder and the dreamer. Uh, dreamers often attach a lot of meaning to the collection of processing of their dreams. Um, in other projects, they end up sending in friends and family dreams and they uh, write about their, they're hoping to produce some really good dreams uh, for submission. There's a real knowledge gap here between the subjects and the individual doing the recording, but it's not as vast as some might think. Um, mass observation streamers, we know from their diaries, were vaguely aware of Freud's theories. One guy talks about uh, his strictly dirty dreams, which are full of Freudfulness. Uh, similarly in Laufen, it appears as if a lot of the dreamers had a basic knowledge psychology, thanks to Hopkins' own lectures. Um, he's got in his notebooks uh, lecture notes from April 1942 on the unconscious and childhood. Um, he's teaching uh, dreamers about psychology while they're dreaming. This does appear, occasionally appear in the notes. So in Dream M25, um, he admits that he's been discussing colour with this uh, the subject a couple of days before, whether you can perceive colour in dreams or not. Uh, the subject then vividly dreamed he was sat in a restaurant. He was drawn to the uh, clearly and vividly coloured tartan patches on the man sitting next to him. Um, so it appears from his notes that like mass observation in wartime London, Hopkins was trying to collect these dreams en masse to ascertain dominant images. Uh, mass observation admitted failure in this, but Hopkins seems to have been quite certain he'd identified a number of images and themes which kept reoccurring. Uh, in his article on the historical uses of dreams, Tyrus Miller claimed that the psychic differentiation produced by modern liberal societies makes dominant images difficult to identify, especially when you look at Edmund Burke writing at 17th century clergyman's dreams, it's just a smaller world. However, this kind of fails to account for the small semi-closed community of the prison camp, um, where Hopkins seems to be really convinced he can chart the mental life of the camp above and below the surface. Um, he's able to identify a relatively small number of green Im images which reoccur. Uh, he then creates an index of the dreams recorded. He tracks numbered dreams. Um, he's, every contributor is assigned a number. He tracks them over time. Um, he records precise dates. He draws up a massive grid um, where he lists the characteristics of each dream. Um, he identifies themes such as self-preservation, sex, hunger, pugnacity, emotions including anger, annoyance, anxiety in particular, um, and then he calculates the percentages. This must have taken hours of work. Um, and he's, he then completes a full statistic analysis of his 11 most prolific dreamers who provided 367 dreams. Uh, he claims that he's got instincts appearing in 73% of these dreams, which are self-preservation, self-assertion, sex, hunger, the group instinct only appears in 20% of dreams, which he claims as a, in support of his theory that uh, there's a real tension in communal life between the individual and the group. Um, as a lay analyst with little to no formal instruction in dream analysis, his approach is really eclectic. It's based around the few relevant works he can source within a prison camp. He appears to have been most influenced by Carl Jung, or rather by what he could read of Jung in the textbooks and works of popular psychology he could get hold of. Um, he agreed with his tutor Valentine's opinion on Jung, which claimed that dreams could reveal the struggling up within the self of partially neglected impulses of a higher order. Similarly, he's got hold of William McDougall's work on a, a normal psychology. McDougall was analysed by Jung. Um, this claims that dreams could provide guidance for our conduct because dreams are influenced by the whole personality, including unconscious aspects. Over time, Hopkins developed his own ideas about the impact of captivity on the psychology of POWs. Um, he drafts a note to other POWs asking for dreams, saying that he's found an extension of the primary function of dreams to influence waking life. So he starts looking for dreams of uh, people returning home or strongly emotional dreams. 
Um, he sees the dreams experienced in captivity as a source of guidance provided by the unconscious at what for most POWs is a real moment of crisis. Um, some of this guidance is deeply individual. I'll talk about uh, Dreamer 11 in a couple of minutes, uh, but there's also a wider undercurrent within the camp of kind of morale. Um, and this is having a direct impact on the unconscious messages that Hopkins claims he can find in the dreams. The progress of the war outside the camp appears over and over again, indirectly in the dreams and directly through the notes. Uh, often the surface content of the dream doesn't show this, but Hopkins finds it hiding within um, in July 1940, a prisoner has a dream about a lecture on geometry where nothing makes sense. Uh, Hopkins claims this is actually disguised protest because the Padre has given a lecture on geography two days before where he claims the war won't be over until 1942. Um, there's a number of anxious dreams at one point. Hopkins claims that there's an anxiety regarding invasion of England and the dreams are trying to resolve this. And finally, there's a massive wave of optimism in late 1940 about the war's conclusion which manifests itself in a load of dreams with compensatory aspects of prisoners or positions of power. Um, in Hopkins kind of schema, the dreams are acting as an aid to morale. They're helping soldiers keep the faith while behind the barbed wire. Um, so while analyzing the psyche of the camp as a whole, Hopkins also delved deeper into some individuals and appears to have been kind of leading this interpretation on pushing it into the dreams. In the case of Dream 227, uh, the notes show the subject was very insistent on having his dream interpreted. Some people were happy to submit this person wanted an interpretation. Hopkins uh, tried to provide one. So the subject sees Churchill giving a speech. This is interrupted by the venue bursting into flames, which Hopkins interprets as um, Churchill's speeches show intention to continue the war, which will lead to destruction of property. His attitude is opposed to the subject's wishes. So the subject wants a quick peace and return home. The subject dreamed that he tried to save a chair from the inside of the house, but instead ran out carrying a bag of cheap tableware as used in the camp. Hopkins felt that this meant the subject was in favor of action, which will save property from destruction, but hasty action will be at the cost of something more valuable. A hasty peace will mean another war. What at first appears to be a confusing mess of images, um, you know, Churchill, a fire, some tableware, is interpreted by Hopkins as internal tension over the progress of the war between desire for a quick peace, which really won't satisfy anyone and will result in another war versus liberate, uh, versus um, a long slog to victory. Over time, dreamers begun to interpret their own dreams. In dream 447, the dreamer experienced being on board a ship heading through treacherous waters and seeing the wreck of another ship called the Potiphar. The subject claimed that this is because the ship he's on is England, the treacherous journey is the war and the wrecked ship was France which was called Potiphar to signify his imprisonment because Potiphar in the Bible imprisons Joseph. Um, Hopkins, however, disagreed with this. He felt the subject was providing this explanation to vent for inquiry, which might reveal the sexual content painful to the subject. Um, so subjects can and did dispute his, Hopkins interpretations, but he often gives their, their interpretations very kind of small space in the diary. Um, there's a real power dynamic because the diaries were private he would insert information that was he obviously wasn't saying out loud to the contributors. Um, for example, in one, he describes the guy who's submitting a dream as uh, a Nancy boy. And in another, he notes that the prisoner who's given this dream is um, has a reputation for same same sex activity. Um, it appears as if he's right. I'm not sure if he's writing these for himself in the future to look back on these after the war when he's writing his doctoral thesis or if he's intending to submit these to another body. Uh, perhaps Professor Valentine is going to look at them as well. But yeah, um, there's, most importantly, um, in the case of one of his most prolific dreamers, Hopkins appears to have crossed the boundary from the collection and kind of basic analysis of dreams into an actual analytic relationship. Um, in late 1940, an individual who Hopkins calls Dreamer 11 is submitting dreams almost every day. Uh, Hopkins wrote up and followed them um, with copious notes to fully comprehend this case. Um, the case notes reveal that number 11, dreamer number 11 must have discussed not only his dreams, but also his relationship with his family, including several kind of really heartfelt um, difficulties he's been having, his romantic entanglement and all of his innermost thoughts and fears. After dozens of dreams being recorded, Hopkins felt certain to conclude that num uh, dreamer number 11 was a lacking in self-confidence and needed to assert himself more, which the dream was trying to tell him to do. In many of his dreams, he's kind of 
he needs help to get out of a situation with other people. But at the same time, there's a self-assertive impulse appearing, which is guidance from his psyche to help pull him out of this. Um, occasionally, this appears like his ego is growing too large and Hopkins kind of is a bit sceptical. Uh, there's a dream where he's stroking, number 11 is stroking a rowing boat and um, Hopkins claims he's antagonistic to a smooth community. What makes this more interesting is that Dreamer 11, who I've identified, but I'm choosing not to name, um, attempted several times to escape from Laufen POW camp and was later transferred to Colditz Castle. Hopkins' theory that 11 was torn between the group and the possibility of self-assertion and liberation makes more sense when it's revealed that he was constantly planning to escape and was potentially making life more difficult for Hopkins and everyone else in the camp. Um, Hopkins was definitely aware of some escape attempts within the camp because he mentions it some doubt. To conclude, um, we can see this dream analysis project in a variety of different ways. We could see Hopkins as a kind of citizen scientist who's seeking to understand captivity through this kind of collecting and logging dreams for him or someone else to analyze. Uh, we could see him as an, an orthodox analyst in his dealings with Dreamer 11, uh, helping a patient in distress resolve kind of entrenched complexes, helping him move forward in life. Or we could see him like a prisoner, like many others, who is trying to fill hours of empty time with a kind of project of self-improvement. It might produce results, but primarily it's just to alleviate his own boredom. Thank you. Thanks very much for your brilliant paper. And now uh, let me continue with our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Catherine Phipps from the University of Oxford. And the title of her paper is Discussing and Intolerable Anxieties about uh, Interracial Relationships in Morocco in the, late, in the 1940s and 1950s and the Sexual Policies of a Late Colonial State. So, um, Catherine, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Maria. And also thank you so much to our speakers so far. There's some really engaging stuff to, to talk about, uh, particularly these ideas of kind of correspondence and people's kind of intimate intimate lives. I'm just going to share my screen with you. So I've got a few slides. Um, okay, so as you can see, yeah, today I'm talking about anxieties about interracial relationships and the sexual policies of the late colonial state. Specifically, I'm talking about relationships between uh, European women and Moroccan men in the French protectorate in Morocco in the early 20th century. Um, you can see here a, um, a section of a letter um, this is a, from a woman named Genevieve, and this paper looks at the experiences of women like her, many of whom were forced to be expelled from Morocco for having intimate relationships with Moroccan men. Sexual relationships between European women and Moroccan men provoked fierce emotional reactions in the French administration, as the sexual desire they felt um, threatened carefully structured racial boundaries and imperial sexual hierarchies as did the intensity of the emotional attachment some of these women experienced. Um, these sexual relationships were considered to threaten both the dignity of the state and the individual men, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, consequently, European women were punished for these, their transgressive sexual desire. The French administrators addressed these liaisons with the draconian decision to forcibly expel um, uh, women from the protectorate in Morocco. Uh, this was a, quite a common tactic um, within the French administration and the French government at the time to kind of remove undesirable foreigners, considered a threat to public order, as Daniel Gordon's shown. Uh, yeah, what, what constituted a threat to public order was often politically motivated and indicated contemporary governmental anxieties. So this is um, just a quote from the kind of the expulsion order, the, the memo, the government memo. Um, the, qualified that um, any women who were engaging in these relationships were incompatible with the dignity of a European woman in a Muslim country. Um, and so because of this, this governmental memo, a collection of letters soon accrued. Um, there was an order that any correspondence that was shown to kind of provide evidence of uh, these relationships needed to be seized. Um, and that also counts as kind of phone transcripts, uh, telegrams. And so because of that, we have a nice lovely little archive that looks like this. So you can see here on the right, you've got a phone transcript between two people um, and that's kind of documented. And on the left, you've got a letter that's obviously been seized and then kind of transcribed. Um, and so that's, that, that's what I'm working on at the moment. So at least 107 women, uh, mostly European, mostly French, 
so I'm all European rather, mostly French, um, they were accused of threatening public security by engaging in sexual contact with Moroccan men. And it's important here to note that the quantity of information uh, varies. Um, so for example, for some women, we have you know, uh, two or three letters, for some women, we have only their names. Um, but from what I've got so far, I can tell you that the average age of women involved in these affairs was about 30. Um, and at least 53 of them were married. Um, 31 of them were employed, mostly as kind of professional jobs, like a typist, a secretary or an office worker. Um, the most important thing is that of these 53 married women, we know where their husbands were employed in 46 cases. And 44 of these 46 cases, uh, the husbands were involved in, they were kind of part of the global administration. So they're either working in the army, they were either civil servants. Um, and so we can generally sort the women into two, two categories that obviously were not mutually exclusive. Uh, so they were either young women earning their own wage and kind of relatively emancipated and independent, or they were the wives of the men responsible for maintaining an imperial presence in Morocco. So these letters and phone transcripts uh, contain as evidence within the case files, um, offer particularly revealing insight into female sexuality, female sexual agency, and most significantly, female emotional attachment. The reader of these letters and friendships can glimpse how European women interacted with the men for whom they felt a sexual and emotional attachment in what they imagined to be a private setting. None of these women ever thought that anyone would be reading their letters, obviously. That's why they're able to be so candid about their attachment. Um, and so there's one element of this I'd particularly like to talk about today, if we're considering a kind of emotional history of um, imperialism, and that's uh, a feeling called le kefar. Um, so at least three of the women um, uh, within this archive used the word kefar to express their unhappiness. Uh, le kefar was a vital element of the emotional economy of French North Africa and the French Empire in general. Uh, to have le kefar was a well-established, well-recognized emotion within French colonial societies. It was uh, between the kind of melancho melancholia and a nostalgia for one's French homeland or hometown. It was considered to be a feeling of bored sadness at being overseas in a far-flung corner of the French Empire. This was an emotion tied specifically to the experience of being French and living far from the metropole. In her handbook for French women in the colonies, uh, Clotilde Chiva Baron describes Le Cafard as a harmful beast that the French woman has to exterminate. Um, she likens it to a disgusting cockroach, and, and there's a pun there because kefar means either the sadness or it means literally a cockroach. Um, a disgusting cockroach that has to be chased from the house, and she suggests that women keep their own kefar at bay by learning botany, ethnography, or playing the violin. So within men, le kefar was also feared, uh, feared to lead to alcoholism and drunk consumption. And so Shiva Bahon encouraged women to travel abroad with their husbands to prevent excess drinking. So you can see how it's kind of gendered. Women get rid of it by, you know, collecting flowers. Men, be careful you don't drink too much. Um, it was also um, an important part of French colonial cinema and cultural depictions of life in the empire. Uh, the 1937 film Pepe Le Moucou uh, portrays Le Cafard as a normal emotion that Europeans were expected to feel outside of the West. Men were expected to respond to Le Cafard through alcohol and anger, uh, like the titular character, um, Pepe, uh, Pepe Jean Gobain. Um, but women were expected to embody it in a different way. So we have here uh, oh, the French actress and singer named Freyel. She plays the, the role of Tanya, who is um, a middle-aged overweight sex worker in the Casper in Algiers. She tries to help Pepe uh, avoid Le Cafard. And she explains that when I have Le Cafard too much, I change epoch. I look at my old photos and I say to myself that I'm in front of a mirror. And she plays records from her youth in Paris on the gramophone. So the typical feminine reaction to the kefar was considered to be nostalgia for the past. Uh, the male experience was expected to be one of kind of frustration and anger. To kind of, um, but both men and women were likely to turn to substance abuse, as Freyl also explains. Um, although women had a responsibility to prevent this in men. All of the people involved identified with the familiar term le kefar. Um, to explain their emotional state and how they subsequently reacted. And as I said, in at least three instances, it was tied to European women engaging in sexual contact with colonized men. So each instance that the women employ this term is to explain why they are contacting their lover. Uh, this implies they're reaching out to their lover as a result of the kathar. So one woman um, tells Ali, a local shopkeeper, that I wanted to write to you because I have the kathar or to see you if not. 
Simony, another woman, Madame X. Uh, she explains that her kafa was alleviated by a letter from um, her lover and also implies that he should send her more letters to prevent it. Uh, Genevieve, we mentioned in the, in the first slide, she uses her great big unavoidable kafa uh, as a way to persuade her lover, Abdurrahman, to telephone her. And she remarks that she went to the hotel to wait for him to call, but will wait patiently tomorrow evening. So these women believed that the contact with their indigenous lover would assuage Le Kafa, and they also expected that Moroccan men would want to help alleviate it. They also expected that these Moroccan men would understand what was meant by Le Kafa. So Kafa was supposed to result in self-destructive tendencies, in unnecessary violence or consuming oneself with drugs or alcohol in search of a way to kind of forget the ennui of colonial life. Uh, yet, following other self-destructive impulses to seek the same rush of adrenaline, certain European women instead turn to these taboo relationships when facing this emotion. For European women in Morocco, part of the appeal of sustained sexual contact with Moroccan men would have resulted from breaking taboos. Uh, Foucault addresses this element of sexual excitement, acknowledging that evading a power that questions, monitors, watches, spies, searches out papates and brings to light can result in a distinctive pleasure that kindles at having to evade this power. So it's highly likely that the pleasure of these relationships was intricately linked to the sensation of transgressing, of breaking the rules of colonial society, of the potential to scandalize those around you and getting away with it. The role that European women played within colonial society was strictly regulated. Married women were constrained with pressures to fulfill a certain ideal of so scientific, civilized motherhood, that was particularly valued in such highly racialized societies. Unmarried women were considered a threat to imperial stability and female sexual desire was tightly controlled and often punished, certainly when it transgressed boundaries. The kafa was an emotion resulting in destruction. As self-pitying as it may have been for Europeans responsible for an oppressive imperial system to experience this, the kafa suggests a sort of navel gazing frustration with the realities of colonial life. This frustration and boredom could be turned inwards through abusing drug, or drugs or drink, but some women thought the same sexual high, the same high rather, through sexual contact that they understood to be forbidden. Pepe, uh, in the film Pepe de Moco, his reaction to Le Kefar was one of mounting anger and violence against those around him, as he feels increasingly trapped within the winding streets of the Caspar, the feeling he's watched wherever he goes. The reaction of these women, however, suggests that the same resentment towards the strict rules and racial hierarchies of a colonial system, but also uh, tightly imposed regimented gender-based codes of conduct. Um, just before I finish, I also want to point out, however, that we will be mistaken to assume that because these European women demonstrated frustrations with some kind of racial hierarchies, um, that doesn't mean that they kind of rejected the racial hierarchies of imperialism by any means. Obviously, they were still involved within the kind of imperial machine as agents of empire, you know, they were married to the people um, who forcibly enforced um, empire. And also lots of them were kind of employed in schools that disseminated imperialist knowledge. Um, and their private lives don't discount this. Um, and also they rarely kind of abandoned expectations of racial hierarchies uh, within the relationships themselves. So one woman, we said, she was um, engaged in a relationship with a, um, a man named Mohammed, but in one case, when a Moroccan man pushed in front of her in a cafe, she instantly started shouting racial slurs. So obviously, unsurprisingly, choosing sexual contact with a colonized man by no means signified a lack of racial prejudice. So Le Kefa was an emotion that Europeans were expected to experience in overseas empire, the result of which was often self-destructive tendencies towards substance abuse or, sexual, uh, or excessive violence. Some women, European women pursued sexual relationships with Moroccan men as a result of experiencing Le Kefa finding pleasure in so deeply transgressing the codes of colonial society. Yet, although they, these women aimed to discard many of the hierarchies upon which European imperialism was built, they were unable to remove the racial hierarchies that underpinned the European presence in North Africa. Their relationships and personal beliefs still demonstrated contemporary beliefs of European social racial supremacy. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for your... Uh, fascinating paper. Um, and now let me introduce you to our last speaker on this uh, panel today, who is uh, Professor Penny Summerfield uh, from the University of Manchester. 
And the title of her paper is uh, Love, Privacy, uh, Sex, and the Self in World War II Correspondence. So, um, Penny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, share screen. Oh. Uh, okay, can you see that? Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, good. Okay. Right. Yes, we can. Good. Thank you. Um, okay, so for the last couple of years, um, really through lockdown, since um, my book, Histories of the Self, came out, that book is about historians' practices with various types of personal narratives. I've been exploring um, the potential of diaries and particularly letters for unlocking the history of emotion in Britain in World War II. And today's paper is a very recent experiment on those lines. I really want to emphasize that it is work in progress and look forward to your feedback. My objective is to historicize the cells and emotions constructed in a set of letters from World War II, and I am just using one set of letters. These are letters between a young working class couple from the south of England called Stan Picard and Chris Turnbull. Um, now, as well as offering social historians a rich source of evidence about life on the home front and the front line in World War II, these letters are sites of emotion and subjectivity, as in much correspondence, the writers construct themselves and each other in a process mediated by the learned cultural practice of letter writing. Stan and Chris write about their love for each other, they hint at their sex lives together, and in particular they give voice to the jealous anxieties they experienced when they were apart. Now, there's some wonderful work on the history of emotion in 20th century Britain. Michael Roper, Amy Bell, Joanna Burke have written histories of fear and anxiety in both world wars. And Claire Langhammer has written a history of love in the 20th century. But jealousy has received little attention from historians to date. Peter Stearns has done some work on it, but it's rather schematic and distanced from individual subjectivities. So if, if jealousy is a neglected aspect of the emotional history of British society and culture in World War II, this set of letters that, that I'm using perhaps provide a starting point for exploring it. Okay, now I'll give you some details about the couple who wrote the letters. Stanley Picard was born in 1920 and Christabel, Christabel Turnbull in 1919. Stan's parents were a railway clerk and an ex-domestic servant. They aspired to set up with social mobility and Stan received a grammar school education to the age of 18, then followed his father into clerical work on the Southern Railway. Chris was more firmly working class. She was the daughter of a building worker and a housewife. She left school at 14 and went to work in a laundry, a job she continued to do during the war. Stan, as a young fit man who was not in an occupation considered essential, was required to serve in the armed forces. In May 1941, he joined the Royal Navy. And this was the start of a five year separation for Stan and Chris. It was punctuated by periods of leave. Um, but during this long period of separation, the couple wrote around 1,200 letters to each other. They married in August 1941. They had their first child in June 1944. But Stan was kept in the Navy. He wasn't released until May 1946. And in the last six months before that, 1945 to 46, he was posted to occupy Germany. The family found the letters after Christabel's death in 2016. Um, they deposited in the, in them in the keep in Sussex where I was going to go and study them, but lockdown began. But fortunately for me, one of the sons edited and published the letters and it's the published letters that I've been using. Okay, now letters, particularly love letters, mediate and construct emotion. In a discussion of 19th century French love letters, Martin Lyons writes, personal letters have tactical objectives. They carry rhetorical ploys to provoke certain feelings and they manipulate the reader's emotions. 
In Stan and Chris's declarations of love for each other, the rhetorical ploys reveal differences in their written styles and levels of education, and they underline the point that letter writing is a learned cultural practice. Grammar school educated Stan penned literally, literary flight, flights of fancy. One day, the aching I have in my heart for you will swell to such proportions that my frame will be unable to bear it and I shall burst into small pieces, all flying in your direction, he wrote in October 1942. Chris replied appreciatively, but in ways that bear witness to feelings of educational deficit and inferiority. I'm not very good at writing these things, but you know I love you beyond anything else, she replied. The love letter was a literary genre that she recognised but found unusable, while Stan made full use of it in writing. Epistolary evidence, however, points to embodied practices and suggests that Stan found it difficult to voice his love in person. Chris wrote crossly that she wasn't going to try to write eight pages a day on how much she missed him because it's bad enough having to do all the lovemaking when you're at home. Stan defended his restraint in the language of national characteristics, explaining that he could not speak his love because I am English. Now, I, I want to ask if it's possible to historicize this kind of so-called lovemaking. Why was it so important to this 1940s couple, not just before they married, but after they married? In her study of the history of love in mid 20th century England, Claire Langhammer confirms the sociological idea of a 20th century shift from the concept of marriage as an institution to marriage as a relationship. She argues that pragmatic materialism in the search for a partner declined in importance and that love and marriage became defined increasingly in sexual and romantic terms. And this shift created expectations that couples would express and experience these elements, not only during courtship, but also within marriage and exclusively towards one another. In the case of Stan and Chris, who, as I said, married in August 1941, the anxiety they felt about such expressions of feeling has a palpable presence throughout the correspondence. And it's most obvious in their preoccupation with each other's fidelity. Jealousy is a theme in the letters from their earliest point to the very end of the correspondence, and it gives it a, 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 an incredible emotional intensity. Marriage and the birth of their child didn't lessen it. Chris's stories about American and Canadian soldiers who visited her at home bearing gifts were a source of grievance to Stan. His accounts of various Wrens, members of the Women's Royal Naval Service, with whom he played tennis and went swimming when posted in Lowestoft and Felixstowe, provoked waspish responses from Chris. Accusations of having changed flew between them and they used rhetorical ploys to communicate resentment and achieve reconciliation. So just to give one example from a, a, a late point in the correspondence, in an epistolary flare up in March 1946, after receiving a photo from Stan, who was posted at that time to occupy Germany, of a woman draped over him, Chris wrote a letter shorn of the usual opening endearments and final row of kisses. She wrote, Dear Stanley, I don't feel particularly fond of you this evening, so I won't call you darling. Stan sent protestations of love in the face of Chris's coolness. I love you, damn it. And then there are nine kisses for you if you want them. Chris's anger eventually subsided and she wrote, I do love you such a lot, so I'll stop this silly pretending that I don't. Stan's jealousy had a controlling edge to it, derived from the gender inequality between him and Chris and sharpened by wartime circumstances. While Stan accepted Chris's work in the laundry, he was consistently opposed to her taking up war work, which she wanted to do from early in the war. He used economic as well as emotional and sexual arguments. In October 1942, he wrote, if you join the Wrens, I shall cut you off completely. I shall neither write to you nor try to see you. I shall allow you no money whatsoever. I know what the life of a Wren is like, and I know only too well the prevalence of a certain type of human beast in the Navy looking for a cheap ride on the bus. Chris replied submissively that she didn't want to join up anymore, while Stan, recognising that he might appear 
unreasonable, wrote, my only defense is that my overpowering love for you is the cause. So I was able to see how his behavior could be construed, but he was implacably opposed to Chris expanding her social world in his absence. And while he could constrain her movements, she had no such power over his. Now, Stan was not the only man in the 1940s to expect his wife to be his dependent and to obey him, the cultural norm of the time that was embedded in the marriage farms. Neither was he the only one who tried to take a stand against the pressures of wartime, which not only opened up new types of work to women, but also frequently required them to leave home under state directions. Suspicions about sexual immorality in the women's auxiliary forces abound, abounded, fueled by derogatory innuendo. Stan's exposure to this cultural climate, as well as his experience of male behavior, possibly including his own, inflected his expressions of negativity towards Chris taking up any of the wartime opportunities for women and his perceptions of such opportunities as sexually loaded. Sex, love and war are powerfully caught up together culturally, but giving sexual expression to love outside marriage was problematic in an era in which contraception, particularly for women, wasn't readily available, abortion was illegal, and extramarital sex and pregnancy were at least ostensibly socially unacceptable. Yet, the wartime letters indicate that Stan and Chris had been having sex for nearly two years before they married in 1941. They also indicate, rather astonishingly, that Stan had procured an abortion for Chris in January 1940 by getting an aborty fascian from a shop in Brighton that had ended a premarital pregnancy. They used a similar substance again to end a pregnancy in the first months of their marriage. Such Technologies were illegal, unsafe and unreliable, but they were commercially available in the 1930s and 40s, as, as this advertisement um, indicates. Stan and Chris's <coughs> early, <coughs> early sexual experience was arguably an important aspect of their relationship and of their jealousy. Their joint delight in sex prior to marriage, which comes through the letters, seems to have bred awareness of the possibility that each partner might be tempted to experiment with others, especially when separated because of the war, and so fueled their mistrust. Chris's letters professed her fidelity and the absence of any other intimate relationships. They also suggest a lack of sexual confidence. Sometimes I wonder if I had had more experience with men, I should make you a better wife, she wrote. As for Stan, historians have argued that military service was an important source of information about sex for men, both informally and as part of their basic training. The sex talks for new recruits were themselves indicative that the authorities anticipated that soldiers would be sexually active. Stan's letters hinted at the possibility of extramarital sex relationships, or at least for flirtations. Just again, one example, he wrote from Germany in February 1946, tomorrow night there is another Wren party here. I don't know yet if I shall have to fetch any of the pretty little birds, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Now, he, he may have deployed these hints consciously or unconsciously to remind Chris that he was an attractive man and she was lucky to be married to him. Now, I'll, I'll conclude with an attempt to explain and historicize the jealousy that inflects the correspondence. Firstly, and th this is quite speculative, but firstly, as sexually active teenage sweethearts who became a married couple, Stan and Chris may have experienced two opposing emotions, a sense of security resulting from early commitment and a feeling of insecurity derived from the knowledge that the renunciation of alternative sexual opportunities might be no more than a sensible, especially given the instabilities of the wartime situation. Secondly, Jealousy was also a response to a mid 20th century problem that affected many lives. Emphasis on emotional companionship and sexual intimacy was thought to create a type of marriage that contained the seeds of its own destruction in that a collapse of mutual attraction and cooperation could signal its end because it rested on no other pillars of support, such as notions of duty and obligation. Thirdly, the tensions inscribed in the letters are also testimony to the meaning of wartime separation. 
Separation was an experience specific to every couple, yet repeated throughout the population in the course of a war in which over five and a half million British men and women were recruited into the armed forces and posted away from home. A national increase in casual sexual liaisons and with it a rise in illegitimacy, sexually transmitted disease and divorce was associated with this unusually mobile youthful population. Marriages based on the companionate ideal were particularly vulnerable. The jealousy to which Stan and Chris were prone, I think needs to be seen in the context of such separation and the anger and anxiety it caused. So, so finally, I'm hoping that this very initial exploration of love, sex and jealousy in one couple's wartime less letters points to the possibilities for writing a bigger history of jealousy in the Second World War. Uh, and my, my kind of larger suggestion is that perhaps it's time for jealousy to be understood in its historical context and for its changes over time to be traced and explained. And that personal testimony like letters and diaries provide ideal sources. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Penny. Okay, so um, I have to say thank you to the four speakers for their brilliant papers and to the audience for their questions and their participation. So thank you so much for being here and I hope to see you soon in person in the next conference. So take care and bye-bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>